children's church if you if you need it. It's down and around. You know where it's at, right? Um, so how's everybody doing this evening? Yeah, I'm glad you're all here. Hey, good to see you. Yeah, there's some faces up in this house that I haven't seen for a little bit. Hi. Um, so uh, we're just going to start out by dealing with a couple questions that came in. Like I said, on Wednesday nights when questions come in, I like to nail it right away. Because usually if one person's thinking a question, then another person has that same thing. And so it's pretty cool to just nail it, right? So uh, this is a group regarding um, all forms of recovery, which means from trauma, abuse, and addiction. And when you separate addiction away from trauma, it's very difficult to find healing for addictive behavior because at the base of all addiction is some type of trauma. Um, and so it's more so, you know, a lot of times we'll, well like we took a young man uh, this last week down to Teen Challenge and, um, you know, was chatting with him and talking on the way. It's, it's an idea or a thought that it's like, well, it's just the heroin. The heroin's just so powerful. It's just, and, and yet when we would try to talk about, well, where's the depth of, of your pain? Where's, where's the heart of what you're feeling? He couldn't go there. It was just too painful. But the heroin was the issue. No, heroin's an outward sign of an inward problem. You know, anything that we do, overeating, whatever it is, um, is just, it's that thing that's going, I don't know how to resolve this. The Bible talks about anxiety, and Amplified says it this way. It says, if you leave anxiety take place, it causes agitating passions. So there'll be passions that will come up. Like you're passionate about heroin, you're passionate about pot or whatever it is, because there's an anxiousness there, and here that lights that up. And that does make it feel like that's the big to-do, right? It's chemicals, right? It's, it's, it's a weed. <laughs> it's, it's those kinds of things. But we are spiritual beings, and spiritual beings uh, is the majority of who we are, right? We put this body in a fire. All this melts down to nothing. But my spirit is the all, right, that took up the space. And, um, and so it's interesting that, you know, when we're dealing with recovery, that many times what will happen is people will put the spiritual aspect at the lower because i got to deal with my mind. i got to deal with, you know, uh, my emotions or whatever. Yeah, those things do need to be dealt with. But the spirit trumps it all. So usually we'll throw that in the last. Like, well, I better get some God or... Get, get some church or something like that while I'm working on these major areas. Well, if we are spirit beings, and we are, we're created in the image of God, and we want to go with how we are created to get healed, you go against how we're created, it doesn't happen very well. But you go with how we were created, then you have to take a look at it and say, what's the most of who you are? Spirit. Your little gray matter up here. Put your, I think it's you put your two fists together, that's your brain, right? This is your heart, the size of your heart. That's, but this really, this, like, this is it. This is your battle. This is, it's a gray matter. It's an interface that's used by your spirit to record things or speak out things. But it's not the all of you. See? So the question came in, like, well, I don't see, um, let's see how they ask it. I don't see how God... Um, is the big thing to get a person set free. I mean, I know that we need God, but I'm dealing with an addiction. I'm dealing with a trauma. So the question's kind of kind of a saying like, I don't really have time to add religion to this because I'm working on this big project, and later I can add God. Yet, where did you come from? Right? Who created you? Who knows you like no one else? Who sent his son to die for us that he could give us the power to overcome addiction or trauma or these things? God. And so when we, when we look at that, he's the all in all. And um, if we set it up where he's like the, the low man on the totem, you know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we got we to get into that. But that'll be a later deal, you know, that we're working on because we got these big projects we're working on first. If we set it up like that, then we won't feed ourselves spiritually. So we'll be starving spiritually, which is what causes addiction and, and staying in trauma and those things. 
we'll be starving spiritually while we're trying to work on our psyche. And, and if we're more spirit than anything else, then we're, you know, how do they say it? You're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? <laughs> so you're saying, you're saying it different than it should because you're, you're emphasizing it wrong. Do we need to work on the mind? Yes, the Bible says we need to have our minds renewed. But you can't renew the mind without a change of heart. You can change a thought, but you cannot uh, set up a revelation that will direct your life without a change of heart. And the word heart is interchangeable in most places in the scripture. It means spirit, who you are, right? So sometimes you'll hear Christians will say, I just feel in my spirit. Well, that almost makes it sound like there's you and then there's this other part of you, <laughs> right? Um, in some ways, we should just say, well, I, you know, I've been feeling this because I am spirit, right? So, um, so the question um, for this person and, and for others who have asked that is, you know, where do we put God in all this? He has to be the all in all. He has to be. There has to be an authority higher than you. Huh? That's, you know, that's why A says, well, pick your higher power. And that's why I've always had a problem with people picking a light bulb or a chair or whatever. And it's like, that is so degrading to you. You are made higher than a chair. But now you're going to pick something lower as your higher power? Think about that. That's why it doesn't work. And so sometimes um, if we work the program, the program works. Yeah, you ever go to treatment or something like that, and people are like, I've been treatment 15 times. So dumb. It doesn't work. Tons of money or whatever. Well, I, I beg to differ. Even a poor program, when you work the program, the program will work. So I never look at the programs. I, lo I look right here. Like, how can I change me up in here? Why am I not hearing what they're saying? What I mean, it would have to be really bad that I wouldn't get something out of it. Right? But if you approach a program, which is a digital writing, if you approach that like that, then you've also uh, left out the spirituality. Well, the spirituality is the side thing. No, the spirituality is the thing. That's what people have to get. If you don't make it the thing, we're in trouble. Because now it's just trying to outwit your thoughts. And we've talked about this many times. You can't even win an argument with yourself. <laughs> I mean, you can't. I mean, how many successful arguments? I mean, you're arguing. I'm not talking about you saying, that is enough. I'm moving over here. I'm, making, I'm choosing a higher thought. It, it's more like, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. No, uh huh, huh. You know, and you're going back and forth like that. You lose every time with yourself. And so there has to be a higher authority than you. And then we have to come under that higher authority. So I always say run with some big dogs. You've heard me say that before. In fact, we did a series that had that in it for a few weeks or whatever. And I got a big dog pillow in my office. And used to have a big dog can up here because people would come up and throw their drugs and stuff in it. Well, then we found out that they don't like officers and the law don't like when we do that. They like when they get rid of this stuff. But you can't just put it on a stage. So I was like, oh, you know, so, <laughs> well, I mean, I was, I mean, I remember praise and worship going on and a, and a thing of cigarettes going past my head. Somebody was like, I'm done. I'm flicked it on the stage. Yeah. But, you know, we had to change that up a little bit. But running with big dogs means you're going with somebody who's gone somewhere you haven't gone and has something you don't have. Why would we go after the same information? I'm going to run with that person because they know what I know. Well, sweet, now you got a friend, but that's not a person who's going to take you to a higher thought. He's got an equal thought. She's got an equal thought, but not a higher thought. So this is why we'll avoid counseling or avoid classes like this or whatever, because sometimes there's a higher thought that comes out, and we go, well, I don't like that. I don't see where we should have to do that. That's taking it too far. These are things that go, that go on. Sometimes we get people who get mad and they get up and leave. Well, I'm supposed to make you mad, sad, or glad, or all of the above. That's how it's supposed to go down, right? Otherwise, I would just be talking the same thing you already know. God is love. He has a plan for your life. 
let's just shake the hand of the person next to you. You know what I'm saying? And those are nice things. But you have to be challenged in the lower thoughts. The higher thought has to challenge that. So um, where do you get higher thoughts from? If you just pulled out my knowledge base and put it here and said, I, you know, hooked it in like you could hook into a computer and just say, let's watch your knowledge base. First of all, that would be scary. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Some parts it might look like a horror flick. I don't know. But um, you're just like, whoa. But that's my knowledge base, right? Without emotion. It's just there. Here's the facts. This is what I know. This is what happened. All of that kind of stuff. And so we take that knowledge base. It's there as a recording, but it's not supposed to be there as your freedom center. Your heart, which is your spirit, which is who you are, is your freedom center. Huh? So this is where sometimes people will scoot around. I scooted around. Where you scoot around, you go, oh, man. Can I just, like, come in the back door, grab some freedom, and leave out the God thing? It's just like over the top. I Maybe mean, people are crying during service and raising their hands. Somebody's shouting. That's just like over the top. <laughs> what we're trying to do is like, could I just get some knowledge base to put in my knowledge area? And that way I'll have a higher thought. You might have a higher thought, but you will not have the character to support that higher thought. You only get that through a, a, a changed heart. Right on? How do you change your heart? Try to change your heart with just talking digital thoughts. Mm, no. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. But when you hear the word of God, you're hearing Jesus, which means you best not just hear it digitally. You better develop a relationship. When you have a relationship, it means you relate. Like I can relate to that. What God said to me, I can relate to it. And I know I'm so loved he relates to me. He's been through it all. He's been tempted in every way, just like us. So he gets me like we can relate. And so then we have this relationship, not a religion. Right on? Look it up in the dictionary. One of the meanings to religion is to go back to bondage. We're all excited about doing that. No, no, we don't want to add another thing to our, because religion, if you practice it properly, it's very digital in the brain. It's not a heart thing. It's like, well, this is what we do here. This is how we stand. This is when we sit. This is what. The, it, it's that. It's a rote. And you get in a rote, you'll get in a rut. And when you get in a rut, you'll rot. We don't want to do that. So, um, so it is highly important if you want to be free from trauma, abuse, bad memories, unforgiveness, hating yourself, addiction, I could keep going on, any of those things, it's sweet to get some info up in here in the frontal lobes. Record some things. That's nice. But you have to have a heart change. And sometimes my biggest freedoms came when I didn't have the knowledge to support it. Like I got in a prayer line. God blew my face off. I'm, at the, I'm on the floor bawling. Stuff's coming out of me, just like all the pain and everything's like, whoa. I'm not saying you have to do this, but this is how it happened to me a few times, right? And so if somebody asked me, so tell me about that. I didn't have a knowledge base for that. I'm like, I don't know what happened. That was my answer. I don't, I, God, I have no idea. I can't even tap what that was. I just know it was bigger than who I, I am. I've never experienced that in all my life. But I couldn't put a knowledge base to it that said, and here's how it works. Step one, step two, step three. I was just like, I don't know what's happening, but I can feel his presence. And I, when I felt love for the first time, it was, I didn't understand it. See, because to me, the way that I was raised, I knew this is how you love a child. This is how, you know, because I babysat a lot and I had a lot of little cousins and stuff like that. I love children. I still do to this day. Um, but when it came to falling in love, because you know how that works. You're just walking along and all of a sudden you trip and you fall. <laughs> and you're like, oh, look at that. You fell in love. No, it doesn't work that way. 
You might have had an attraction, but that doesn't necessarily mean you fell in love because the character of love is something that wants to make a commitment and long term. It locks in. It's like, I love you. In the word, and that literally means in the Greek, I prefer you. Over everything else, I prefer you. So who is love? God is love. And when he says he loves us, he prefers us over everything else. That's pretty stinking sweet, huh? Yeah. So, um, but we have to allow him to love us. And so go ahead and love me digitally. You know? <laughs> like I'm thinking some thoughts right now. It's coming in digitally. I'm loved. No, sometimes my thoughts don't even line up with what I'm feeling right here. There's such a move. Tears well up. Sometimes I'm like, I feel like I need to repent of something. <sighs> Did I have a digital thought about that? No, it came up from here first. So if you, I'm just going to say A-A-N-A-N-E-A at all, right? You go to something, and um, you go there digitally. A lot of us did that the first few times. We're like, all right, what's step one? Got to memorize this thing, you know. Got to have the 12 steps memorized. Okay, and we memorize them, but we do it in a digital way. So the first time through, we're just like, yeah, I did that. I, I went through. I'm on my 12th step, and and. And then we go back to use, or it just doesn't feel like it's cutting it. Because we miss the heart change. We got the knowledge, but the heart change. That's why if I go to teach uh, the 12 steps, which I have done, and you go through that, because I've had a heart change, I can't go through those steps without slowing everything down and taking it word by word. And sometimes I cry. Because it's so like, oh, man, I got I to gotta take a, a, an estimate of myself. I got to stop everything and see where I'm at. Thank you, Jesus, that you set it up this way. That I don't have to be in survival mode. I can actually stop and take an estimate of myself, take an inward view of myself. Just, just that concept is deep. But if you're in counseling, they you go through the steps and they say, well, you know, you really have to take an inventory of yourself. And you're like, well, I guess my assignment is you got to write this stuff down and then I'm supposed to bring it back to counseling or share it in class. Digital. Digital. And we all start out in a thought pattern. But the point of the 12 steps is that you don't stay in the thought pattern. It becomes like, no, this is how this works. I don't even know if I can quote all of them, but I'm telling you what, I can feel them all. They come up from my gut like a fire. So then when somebody says, hey, you want to use, I'm, there's a fire there. There's something burning that just goes, no, I'm actually looking at you and saying, why do you want to use? What's going on with you, man? Are you hurting? See, so it goes to the heart for the next person that you minister to right away when you've had a heart change. Otherwise, you look at people like, well, my neighbor's using, so or she's going through trauma or whatever, so this is what I did, so here's your 10 steps. Go ahead and do that. It's very digital. People don't feel loved. They don't feel gathered in. I mean, part of what the mother's role of, is in the family is the nurturer. The father, the one of the meanings to the word father is the overseer. So you have oversight, right? There's a rulership. There's a reigning. Women are supposed to have that too. We're both supposed to have that ruling and reigning. Um, and part of that is where you come up and you're able to see things from a heart view and not from a view that is um, digital. The most boring classes are the digital ones. Today's lecture, <laughs> I'll be dealing with blah, blah, and you're just like, <laughs> you know, I'm so, you know, <laughs> I have some of those classes online, you know, and sometimes it's five o'clock in the morning, so it doesn't help at all, you know, and so you put it on, you're like, today I'll be sharing on the blah, and they keep their voice like that the whole time, and it's right here, there's no movement but their mouth. I can't do it. I got to get up. I start cleaning things while I'm listening. I can't even look at it. 
I'm just like, you are way too much knowledge base. Talk to me. I learn the best when you're talking to me, not at me. You ever have somebody try to help you and talk at you? Let's say you're crying or you're really upset or you're mad or you're just like screwed something up because you're like, screw this. I'm going to go do this. Right. You enter that zone and someone comes in on their white horse. Yeah. Oh, oh. let me tell you something. They get off and then they they tell you something and they talk at you, but they don't talk to you. And usually it'll say something like, you know what you need to do? And no, you know. Have you prayed about what they need to do? Do you actually really know what they need to do? Do you know what's going on inside of them? Are they hurting right now? None of that matters. This is what they need to do. Now you're talking at them, but you're not talking to them. Yeah? How many have been talked at and it didn't help you at all? What, what is the emotion that comes up when someone's talking at you? Anger. Anger. Ah, you're like, okay, you know, yeah. and because it, it makes you want to defend your position when you're being talked at, then you'll answer them back. Yeah, well, you don't understand. You start coming up in volume because you feel misheard or you're not heard. Right. Sometimes people just want their pain acknowledged. Just like, you know, I'm hearing you. Now, I've never been through. Exactly what you've been through, but I have been through some pain. So I know what it's like to be in pain. So you're probably feeling this right now, huh? Okay, all right. Now I'm talking to you. I am talking to you. So talking at you. How do you think God talks? My sheep hear my voice. How does he talk to you? Lisa, thou shalt go to the church tonight. No, he doesn't do that. There'll be a pull to like, yeah, God, I want to be with you. See, it's relational. Um, but you'll start out, sometimes people will start out trying to form a new habit. And they're like, it's Wednesday night, I probably should be there. But you don't want to live a Christian life or a sober life like that. You want to have that pull like, I need to be in a spot that's sober. That feels so good. I need to be where there's worship. Oh, that feels so good. I need to be where truth is being spoken. I got I to gotta get there. Oh, I don't know. Leave the dishes. Leave the whatever. Let the dog out. Let's go. You know, um, because there's something there. And even if not something really deep happens, you are carrying this in your heart. And there's a movement knowing that other people are moving toward the same thing. Hmm? So this is why I have a little bit more struggle with different groups when they turn into meat markets. Now, should you be able to meet somebody at a class and be attracted to them, maybe even date them and get married to them? Right on. You should be able to. But if you're coming to church because that's your whole purpose... You know, you're coming to the AA group. I mean, I've seen some. I, I, I'm telling you, people, you show up and you meet with people and they're in their pajamas, hair's all jacked, you know. They, don't, they go to the grocery store like that till they go to their group. Then we're talking styling, walking, different. <laughs> right? Because that's what a meat market is. Like, I, I'm going there to hear some digital stuff. I'm not really moved in my heart for my own change or really wanting to change toward God. But there is a cute chick or there's a guy that's really hot. And that's why I go, you know. So we, ha we have to watch for that because digital thinking will pull you into these areas. So if our mind is going to be renewed and by the word of God, there is a digital part when you first read the Bible, right? And, you know, like thou shall not kill. That's digital. I just said it digital. But when you think about it and ruminate on it and let it abide in you and you abide in it, there's a standard that comes up inside of you for the love of people that you don't want to see anyone suffer. There's just a thing that happens. 
And it will actually influence you to do something. When you're digital learning, doesn't mean you're influenced to do anything for anyone at all, even yourself. Right? When your heart has been changed, you leave and you're like, all of a sudden it's like you put these other glasses on and you see people at Walmart. You see, When you get new information and it moves you by God, it's like, oh, my goodness. And right after that information, I saw this person who was hurting, and I went up and prayed with him or just talked to him or I helped him out or whatever because I was moved to do so. I had this compassion come up in me. It just moved me. There's a love. Right on? So having gone to Teen Challenges was a different uh, one than I normally go to. And meeting the counselors that were going to help out with this individual. I just was like, I want to be here. The place was beautiful. And the heart of the people who were doing the interview was over the top relational with God. It was just like, I've been in places where, you know, fill this paperwork out, you know. It's like when you go get your driver's license next. You know, this is, this is something that's intense, like trauma has happened. People are suffering. The whole family's upset. And you come up and you're going to have somebody just be digital at that moment? No, that's not going to work out. You don't need to be talked at. You need to be talked to. So that's what somebody talking to. Second question came in. The second question had to do with the very thing I was just saying, being talked at or being talked to, but referring to the fact that somehow we allow people to talk at us, but we ourselves are muzzled in a response. When you have a muzzle on, you, it's a belief system that says, I'm not al allowed to open my pie hole. Now, if you muzzle a dog, we've raised all kinds of dogs. Right now, we're raising blue ticks, and we got a lot of puppies. And um, they're adorable and everything. But they're not really a dog that you, you'd have to abuse them to get to them to the point of biting. They're just not hunting dogs, but they're just so kind. Like, they'll just sit, and then they'll put their, hand, their little <laughs> foot up and want to shake your, your hand and stuff like that. I mean, they're just, they're just like that. Now, our boxer is a little bit different. <laughs> the Dal Dalmatians that we've raised way territorial um, and you know and they have to be trained in that so we had a, a Dalmatian that we had to muzzle and we had to muzzle her because she had been abused and of course the person let me sold this up she's wonderful she would never bite anyone you know how people do that and then then you got the dog and I go to get up to leave the room and it's cornered me and it's growling at me and it's like oh I don't think that was an accurate description um, so <laughs> But anyway, we had to start out retraining the dog, and we had to muzzle the dog because its mouth and its heart, its emotional state was out of control. It was out of control. That is different than being muzzled because you have a thought pattern that says what you have to say really isn't worth listening to, so shut your pie hole. Or it's just the thing when you feel like when I say something, it's stupid. Nobody acknowledges it. They're not hearing me or whatever. And so over time, either you put the muzzle on or people around you put the muzzle on, and, and you're the nicest. You'd be like that dog. They're just like, oh, you're so nice, and you're wondering why they got a muzzle on. That's different than the dog that's aggressive, right? When you come around the corner and they're like, ah, and you're like, oh, oh. you know, and uh, that our our dog that we had to muzzle for a little bit, her name was Maddie. And you knew when there was trouble and she was territorial because if a neighbor even came, we, I mean, we had quite a bit of space, and you'd see the neighbor come out to get the newspaper even. And all of a sudden, she'd be like, uh, you know? And her front leg always came up, and she positioned like that. And you're like, oh, snap. This is, no, you know? You had to deal with it, like right now. Or you got to muzzle the dog because she's out of control. So sometimes we need to muzzle our mouths enough to regroup what's in our heart before we speak. But that's not where the question came in. The question came in 
is about feeling muzzled when you're not trying to bite somebody. You're just not. You're just a quiet person. You're, you're, you got some hurts or whatever, and it, but it doesn't really pay to talk about it because, first of all, who's listening? And then when they do, they treat you like you should have a muzzle on. Like, you're talking again? Why? You know? And sometimes we'll have gone through that. We're now we're near those people, and we're in a whole different area in our life. Nobody's here muzzling us, but we muzzled ourselves. We're like, yep, that's how I roll now. I just muzzle myself. And we say nothing. It's hard for us to have a boundary, hard for us to stand up for ourselves, hard for us to communicate with our God. And we'll literally stay quiet and expect that if he loves me, he should know. And we'll, do, we'll start doing that with the people around us. Mary loves me. She, she should know how I feel. I, don't, I shouldn't even have to say anything. I mean, come on. She should know. Right? And so and then every time somebody doesn't know, that's just another feather in the hat that says, yeah, I probably should stay muzzled. I'm not important to anybody. But the problem is at that point, we're setting it up, aren't we? We're setting it up that if there were people who wanted to listen to your story, we set it up so they don't get to. How many of you were raised in families where you started talking and someone cut you off? Like all the time. I've been in family groups where so I'll, be, I'll get called over to, you know, there's an argument or something. And all I have to do is ask a question. And it's like five people, blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, like a pinball machine. You're like, all right, which one? Okay, shh. I choose you. <laughs> you tell me what's going on, right? And then, I'll, and then I'll get that. I'll get what's going on from their, their view of it. Then I allow someone else to talk or whatever. But it's different um, if you were raised in that and there was nobody to shut that down. Somebody will just shut down. Were you that person? You're just like, mm, I'm out. Seacrest, out. All right, we just leave. And, um, and, and people don't, many times don't even know you're upset. You just go. You walk off to your bedroom. Because there's too much going on, and it's like you don't exist. So you just opt out. These are trainings that happen in the brain that literally say, what you got to say ain't worth it. So the question was around, how do you get that muzzle off if it's that kind of muzzle? So uh, I was a child of rage for a while. <laughs> and um, so if I needed a muzzle, or be tied up. <laughs> it's kind of the feeling like I was a dog that needed the chain and the muzzle when I was growing up um, because I was so angry. And I didn't say much, but you know, you get that quiet dog that I probably was a Rottweiler, okay? <laughs> you know, I used to work for the post office, and so we had to watch all these videos on the different dogs, and of course, we've raised dogs. It's really interesting. It isn't that Rottweilers are just mean, but they're different. Um, then like our boxer, our boxer will go out and meet you and then he'll kick out the back and make sure he, you know, here's the line and he does all this stuff, right? And barking at you and hair sticking up and okay, he'll do that, right? Um, but the, the Rottweiler studies you. You ever see a Rottweiler just sit on the porch, mailman's going by or whatever and they just go. And they can do that for like a week two weeks or whatever, they do nothing. And then one day they decide, yeah, I got this pattern down. I'm going to pummel them. That's what I'm going to do. It's going to be fun. I'm just going to take them down. Because that's part of how they play. Um, you know, and they don't usually, they're not like, blah, 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 you know, they're not doing that as much. They're just watching you. And so that's probably uh, what I lean toward a lot of the time. You got your Dobermans. <laughs> I want to deliver mail. People would come to their little screen door, and the dog would be like, rawr, 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 you know, and you're like, you know, you're trying to hand, oh, just hand it in. I'm like, no, nah, that door can stay shut. Oh, he's just a big baby. <laughs> no, no, he ain't. I know dogs. Once their hair's sticking up and they're doing all that, I ain't sticking my hand in there, you know. And so, so sometimes we'll be around people. Officers will be around people. 
that it's almost like you got to be chained and muzzled for a little bit. Like you are way out of control. <laughs> and you get pulled back. But should you live the life chained and muzzled? No. But should you live the life where you don't ever share your feelings, your story, your desires, your needs? Hmm? Hardest thing when we had 12 kids is when they got off the bus. You prepared like you're, they're coming. You know, it was like that. There were pans and trays of food out on the counter, and then you just step back, right? Because most of them were teenagers, and, and then they'd come in and just, you know, and consume it, and then they still want supper because, you know, and we just, I mean, I, I was used to really cooking a lot of stuff, but everybody wanted to tell me about their day, right? And I wanted to make sure everybody's day was heard, but that's a real difficult thing. So I had to figure out ways to make sure nobody was muzzled. Nobody out-talked each other. You know, hey, I want to hear you first. I want to know what happened, what, what went down in gym class or whatever. And then I'd go to the next person until we got it done. You'd be there a while. You know? And then there were some that just was like, meh. And those were the kids that meh all the time. Those were the ones who really felt like they wanted to be heard, but they were muzzled. So it takes extra work to unmuzzle. And if you feel muzzled when you are loosed, it's almost like it's almost like a person who spent a lot of time in an institution or in jail, and all of a sudden they open the door and you're like, "So, I'm I'm, I'm going? <laughs> yeah, you can go right out that door, like right now, like right now I can go." And it's the same thing when you finally get an opportunity to talk, then you share. You find that person you share, I don't care if it's a therapist or whatever, and then all of a sudden you just, you're like, oh, man, I let it all out. And then you want to retract it because you're like, that feels really dangerous. I've not done that before, and I just, like, let somebody know. So now you have anxiety about being heard but had anxiety that you'd never be heard all at the same time. Right? How many of you know what I'm talking about when you finally say? It's like having a boundary. You know, we plan boundaries where it's like, you know, he ran me over. If he ever says that again, you know what? I'm going to tell him that. And we start making plans. We run scenarios of what we're going to do. And they never say that thing that way again. But we're all prepared, right? But there's something about us feeling maybe unprotected or on something. And we want to, uh, we want to know that we're, we're safe. Well, finally, you'll have a boundary and you say it. You ever done that? You have a boundary and you're saying, no, that's not going to work for me. I prefer not to attend that. And so you guys go ahead and have fun. Or, well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, no, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Right? And then you walk off, having never drawn boundaries like that before. And your heart's like, duh, 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 duh. and you're like, was I supposed to do that? Like, is that okay? And you have a false sense of guilt for doing what you actually wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So there's something, there's something about that. And when we get unmuzzled and we finally get to share, it's like, uh -huh, you know? And then stuff will just start coming out. At the same time, there's a fear that many people have or a guilt that they're taking your time. Do you know, I'm going to tell you this because some of you do this where you'll come up and you'll talk to me and you apologize five times before you say anything. I know that you're a busy person. I get this, this speech. Yeah, I know I'm a busy person too. So you don't need to tell me that I'm busy. And then, and then it'll, it'll go into, and I don't want to take your time, and I'm so sorry that this is probably way over the top or too much. And then, then you'll say it and then walk off and it'll be like, Sorry. You know, so I'll try not to do it again. I'll try not to talk before start. I'll try not, and it's just like half of the conversation was apologies. <sighs> you don't need to apologize. I'll tell you if I'm too busy. I'll tell you if I'm, I'll be like, this isn't the moment or whatever. That doesn't mean that, you know, you need to apologize. I wouldn't expect 
you to make me apologize if I came up and I said, Ashley, can we talk or whatever? You're like, I don't have time right now. Sorry, we'll have to catch that later. (sighs) I knew I shouldn't have bothered her. (sighs) You know, and then if you see, if I see her talk to somebody else in a different setting or whatever, like, those are the people whose words count, right? (laughs) And we can get into the craziest stuff because we got loosed here. The Bible talks about binding and loosing. Matthew 18, 18, there's a whole section um, in the word that talks about binding and loosing. Binding says, I will not permit this. That's that's what you do when you have a boundary. We're not going to permit this. You can say to the heavenlies, I bind you in the name of Jesus and dealing with something. Yeah, we can pray like that. But really, if I say no to the neighbor dog, I just bound that situation. No, I'm not permitting you. Go home. See, there was a binding that took place because there was she wasn't loose, free to go do whatever she wanted to do in our yard. <laughs> so, so it can be that simple. Loosing literally gives you the ability to be free to do those things that you need to, to do or say the things that you need to say. So sometimes I've actually therapeutically have had people come up because their thoughts have been so overwhelming when it comes to either approaching me or whatever that they will, there'll be a thought that I was busy on Tuesday, so now I hate them. I mean, it goes to extreme. Like, nope, we're not going to be able to meet this week. She hates me. (laughs) Right? And they're like, no, she don't hate me. Um, maybe she does. I don't know. And the thought will go like that. And this is what I'll tell them. I give you permission to come up and tell me the thought that you have, even, even if it's just horrible. Because that's the only way you're going to get free. So many times before service, that word of life, we've had this where people walk up and go, do you hate me? And I'll say, nope, I do not. I love you. <laughs> just needed a reality check. That's what they need it because the mind will start doing the thing of like, I've always been muzzled. Nobody's listening. Why? Why, 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 why? And um, so to get your mouth loose, the question had to, to do with that. I can say you're free to speak. But until you agree with that, the muzzle will not come off. The same way if a husband tells his wife, honey, I do think you're beautiful. Well, whatever. No, serious. I think you're beautiful. Okay, fine. I'm not going to compliment you because you just throw it back in my face every time. Well, I knew that because you, because I'm ugly. No. So it's very difficult if a person can't receive a compliment. Is it the person who's giving the compliment's fault? No, it's the receiver's broke here. The little satellite thing that's inside. The, the pickup area is not like that didn't go in. So I had a couple of those areas, and I remember telling my husband, and I said, get real close to me and look me in the soul, because the eyes are the gateway to your soul, and say that again. And I did everything I could to receive that thing that I did not believe. And then I would say out loud, I believe it. I choose to believe that. And I would not say differently when I walked away. Then later, he would say it again, and I'd say, I choose to believe that. That belongs to me. And after a while, it was like, yeah, that's true. That is true. But if you answer a compliment or answer someone's encouragement with a negative, you did not receive their encouragement. So it's not the encourager's fault. It's the receiver. Shooty baruti, right? That, that's a sensitive area. I can feel that here. It's sensitive. So sometimes we will get caught in the thing um, where we try to impress people so that we get a compliment. And then when they give us a compliment, then we go, like, oh, you're so weird. Why did you say that? And we deflect it. Well, why did you go through the whole process of trying to be noticed? Then you get the compliment, but it's not enough. There's something twisted about that. So here's where when you develop a relationship with God and spirit to spirit, 
and you're in a service or you're in your prayer closet or you just get up in the morning having a cup of coffee, looking out the window, watching a deer eat all the cherries off your tree. That was me this morning. I don't drink coffee, but I was there at the window going like, mm, you know. But all of a sudden, I just felt God speak. And it just came up. It's like, and it was so encouraging. Just small phrases, very encouraging. Now, at that moment, I could be just like, I know, you always say that. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's true, right? That's how you deflect a compliment. That's how you deflect his word. Well, I know that that's true, but is that true for me? Right? Or I've seen people get hurt with that. I mean, we have so many deflections. Rather than he speaks to you and you just go, I hear you. Thank you so much for meeting me right here in what I needed to know this morning, God. Thank you. It's beyond my understanding. My emotions might not even line up with it, but I choose to believe that. I choose to believe that. So part of keeping the, the, the trick here is if you are muzzled here and you do hear something from him or you do see something in the word, you can't even agree with it because you're muzzled. So then it's just a thought floating around in your head. I love you. I have a plan for your life. I want to speak to you about your destiny. And you'll feel this pull. And it's like, oh, it's so relational. But you can't say anything back because you've been trained in your family, trained at your workplace, trained as a kid. You're muzzled. That will thwart your progress in all forms of healing. Because, yes, I need to hear him, but faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. And what comes out of our heart then will come out our mouth. So I had to look at my husband and have him look into my soul and say, thanks for the reality check. I choose to believe that. I had to say it with my mouth. And then I heard myself say it. So I didn't hear myself go, yeah, whatever, you're so weird. That's, that's very junior high. Just saying. If you, I'm, I'm just saying. Junior high will be like, you're cute. Oh, shut up. You're so stupid. I mean, and then we'll insult the person because they complimented us somehow. That's weird. Right? So, But if you're doing that as an adult, you're still deflecting any form of encouragement. And the word encouraged means I want to put courage into you. Now, nobody wants to hear schmoozy talk. Where I come and I'm like, oh, Ashley, you're just the best. You're the great, you know, and I'm doing this whole thing. At first you start out like a compliment, and after you're like, you are just smoozing me right now. <laughs> Smoozy talk is stupid talk. That's what it means in the dictionary. So um, nobody wants to be schmoozed. But when somebody, I don't care if it's through a text, just says, I just woke up this morning and I wanted to let you know I'm proud of you. Now, the challenge is for the receiver. Can I receive that? Sometimes we'll deflect it like this. We won't say out loud how, uh, no, that's not true. Or we won't um, say anything at all. But we have a choice to make. Are we going to receive it? It's a choice that we make. Wow, she said she's proud of me. Sometimes people say, I don't even know how to take that. I don't even know how to receive that. <sighs> See how that'll, that'll go in? Because we're literally saying what our heart is saying. I don't know, that door has never been open that often. And then if, if you raise religious Christian, religious Christian, then you're not supposed to take compliments because that'll make you prideful. When actually, shame is what makes you prideful. Proverbs says, come shame, then what follows is pride. See, wherever you feel hurt, then you get on your high horse to protect yourself. And uh, one of the meanings, like we've shared before, for the word pride is, is the word picture is a puffer fish. <laughs> you know, I, somebody shamed me. <laughs> See, oh, I'm bigger than life. Um, or I like to use the peacock tail, you know, you're walking along, we've talked about that, and, pff, peacock. 
And then everyone goes, wow, they are just so prideful. No, they're full of shame. And they're trying to protect themselves. Different. Right? So if you get a compliment, if you get an encouraging word, and you're staring at it, your heart is debating how much of that can I actually receive. It's very supernatural. That's why sometimes people will hear, you know, God loves you, and everyone goes, uh-huh. I mean, I could stand in front of 10,000 people and say, Jesus loves you. There's going to be a whole bunch of those people just be like, whatever, religious fanatic. It's going to go right over their head. That's why the one-on-one -on -one evangelism is everything. And it isn't you're trying to rack up numbers to get people in the church. You actually care about that person. And they know it. And they stop long enough to receive it. And if they can receive your kindness, they're open to the kindness of God. And it works that way for you. So... I had a whole thing I was going to speak on tonight, but I'm just going off these questions. And I think, I think we need to understand a couple things here. What if you're sitting here tonight and you're presently muzzled? And you're muzzled not because you're, you're the pit bull, you know, <laughs> or, or the Doberman and you're out of control. I mean, those can be really nice dogs. But if, if they were out of control, you would know it. Everyone would fear that. Um, so... So it's not because of that. It's because there's a belief system that says you don't got anything good to say. Who are you to be talking? Hmm? If that's blocked, how do you go boldly before the throne of grace and ask God for anything? First of all, it says we can go boldly. You know... Um, there's a difference between this knock, can I come in, right? You come boldly, you're like, hey, it's Mary, can I come in? There's a boldness that says, oh, man, I can't wait to tell you what I need because it's going to add to what you've asked me to do. So, Lord, all right, let's do this. And then I put my need before him. He said, come boldly before my throne of grace. He's going to answer that need. I'm bold about it. But if you've been muzzled, that is not your approach. You, you can sweat, just sweat it out just when somebody says, let's pray. You're like, oh, you pray. Why? Because I would have to actually say what I wanted. I would actually have to announce my need. I would have to use this pie hole to admit something. I would have to say this is how I feel. I've been muzzled way too long to do that. See that? He wants us free. And sometimes you might think, well, she rambled on about these questions. But the importance of getting the muzzle off is huge. And here's what I know. The brain actually has to have permission. This gray matter is like a computer. Somebody's got to get there and go, just let me type this in for you. Right? There it goes. And then it ricochets through the whole brain system because the computer is trying to decide if it's going to receive this. We need to be able to receive these encouraging words. And then we need to be able to run that off and read it to ourselves. And then we need to be able to say that. And then if someone, here's where boundaries come in. If we can't go through that whole process, if somebody comes up and calls you a dirtbag, you will have nothing to say to them. Just won't. You might throw an F-bomb because you're mad. Just saying what the average person does. Um, but it's not something where it says, you know what, that goes against my belief system. I actually believe I'm worth something. I'm worth something to God. I have a destiny. I'm here for a reason. I just want to help. I don't know why you're losing your mind temporarily at me. 
But it's not a me issue. It's a you issue. And so my boundary is going to be regarding that. And I will say it. Why will I say it? Wow, well, because you're just a bossy person. No, because I care enough about myself because he cared about me. The more I see that what he cared about me, the more I have boundaries for myself. The rote that we get in through trauma is survival rote. It's a pattern that just says, I'm feeling those feelings, must go to survival. And we get back into the pattern. What am I going to use? Who am I going to talk to? They always understand me. Do they? There's something that ends up happening when we receive truth. It will go in and it will confront any lie, any lower thought. Am I not right? Mm -hmm. I want to see you loosed, free, and give your brain permission. Your computer needs permission to start talking. Now, I've had some people in my life that, you know, I got the gift of gab, and it goes all over the place because that's how my brain, you're like, praise God, you can follow. You know, I'm all up here like, what am I talking about? No, uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. And, and so, but at the same time, I've had people critique certain things in my life when I w was younger. You don't talk right. You talk funny. They said the same thing about singing. You sound weird. You're always out of tune. <laughs> then it was weird as I would go into choir, and then I would, you know, you go to the state things or whatever, and I'd take first place. <laughs> Do you think I would believe that? No. What they said was the truth. Now, here's what I know. I don't have the best voice in the world, but I can sing. I mean, I can stay on tune. I'm working on it. You know, I'm not here to be a star. I just want to worship Jesus, and however she comes out, she comes out. But at the same time, I should not feel that feeling if someone gives me the mic to be able to sing. That feeling. America, America. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when we're truly loose, free, and we have confidence, we go, America, America, and we just do it. Now, if I had somebody here who had perfect pitch and everything, they could critique that and tell me everything that's wrong with her or what. But I'm okay. I can sing. And some of you have been picked at for the way you talk, how you address things, what you bring up. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a marching band outside. For those watching online, they're like, what is she doing? Um, so... <laughs> So I want to bring it up because if we're not honest with ourselves, um, then we're not going to be loose free to speak out the things we need to about ourselves and what God has said to us. This is what truth is. See, truth is meant to be declared. So are lies. But if only lies come forth and we sit there and we say nothing about the truth, we're in trouble. Right? So there's something about having the permission to say, I'm going to say it. I've been waiting for a year to bring this up, and I'm just going to go say it. It's the craziest thing how free you will be. Like the one lady that came and says, do you hate me? She, and I said, no. And she walked off. She felt so free. The more she did it, she was like, she said no, so I'm good. Because it was just paranoid thoughts. I've had someone else, their thought, the, the devil just would run over and over in them, is that they were the devil. And at times where they think something is shooting through their mind that was evil or whatever, they were convinced they personally were the devil. So I said, well, you don't just sit through the whole service and say that. I said, you come find me and ask me if I think you're the devil. And then we just address it. And then they have to say out loud, see, I am not the devil. Those are paranoid thoughts. This is what God says about me. But if you're not free enough to admit something and not free enough to bring something up, you're not going to have a boundary for it. So one of the things we do bring up is this. Why do people always run me over? Why am I cursed? Why does it seem like I have a sign on my forehead that says, come and get me? We do verbalize that even when we're muzzled until someone says... 
well, let's deal with that. What's a belief system you should believe? We just go blank. We're like, a big part of how Jesus frees us is he gives us the truth. We receive it and we say it. We receive it and we say it. So let's stand. Now I want you to just close your eyes and think about if you're muzzled in an area or if you feel muzzled overall. Because sometimes we'll be like, no, I can talk about stuff, really? How come you're not talking about that one thing? Uh, I don't talk about that one thing. I don't talk about it to God and I don't talk about it to man. Then there'll be no answers in that area. So if there's something where you feel you're muzzled, I want you to raise your hand. Mm -hmm. So now here's the wild part. If you track the area you feel muzzled in, if you track that back to where you get run over the most, where there's traumatic feelings or those kinds of things, you will see that they're connected. Because wherever you're a victim, everyone else is a bully. So if you can't talk in that area, everyone else is a bully. Whether they're bullying or not, you will walk into a room and see, I am the victim, everyone else is the bully. That's why I can't talk about it. How many of you believe that that is something God wants to change? It would empower you to just be like, you know what? I used to not be able to talk about this, but now I'm saying it. There it is. I just said it. What you going to do? Right? Say it again. Say it out loud. There were some things that I, you know, especially I grew up where there were a lot of sexual sins and stuff that went on. And when that happens, those are things that are like in, in darkness and in secret. So you're taught as a little kid, you don't say nothing. That's a muzzle. And so I remember sharing, I shared in many different places that I had been molested or different things. I just come right out and say it. People are like, oh, well, in church, you got to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, because half the people sitting here have had the same thing. And most of them have never told anybody because they're muzzled. So we carry the pain around instead of taking it to the cross, talking about it, making ourselves in a normal zone and the behavior being the weird thing. I'm a normal person. Behavior was off that happened toward me. But I'm not the victim, and everyone else doesn't get to be my bully. I got some boundaries. And they're righteous boundaries, and they're good boundaries. And you'll have the same once you're, you're loosed. And the other part that we talked about tonight is where's your receiver at? Is it broken? He'll heal that. If you can't take a compliment, you also can't take criticism for sure. Or instruction in whatever area you're in pain in. Huh? It's, it's wild how that's, that's a, a, like a, a, an area that's an indicator. So, Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And we bring our mouth before you since the Bible says this is... This is the area that we speak faith things out of. And if we faith that we're ugly or we faith that we're nothing or we faith that we shouldn't be heard, you don't want that for us. And, and we actually don't want that for ourselves, but it's been told to us. So, God, we ask forgiveness for believing it. And we choose to forgive those who put it on us. Right? You got to say that. Here's what I'm looking for. I said it. But when I pray and something, even if you whisper it, you have to say it or you're still muzzled. Huh? I'd say right out loud, God, I just forgive those who have sinned against me. Mm-hmm. And I turn up the ability to receive. Mm-hmm. No fear. I have value. Amen? Amen? You have value. You have the right to be heard. 
Yeah. Father, and I ask that you direct people to the right person to hear them. I don't just say everything to everybody, but the first person who needs to hear me is you, Lord. We need to be heard by you, and you're listening. We're just not saying anything. So, Father, thank you that everyone here tonight is loosed free to speak, to share emotions, to share desires, to share what their dreams are, to share uh, what their pains were, to ask forgiveness, to create a relationship in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, also, if you're a person who just needs to say a phrase to somebody, I like these big old ears right here. They're kind of big. I think they're big because I listen. I listen, listen, listen to a lot of people. And I think I'm not God, but I mean, if there's just something, even a phrase you wanted to say, hey, I just want to tell you this. You want to get something off your chest or whatever? Some redirection. Do that. Dave's here and his wife's here. Mary Roloff's is here. There's other people. Shelly's here. That you can, Ashley's here. Ashley's here. You could turn and say to them, hey, here's what the deal is. There's people here that'll minister to you also. But sometimes we just need to say a phrase and be like, hey, by the way, I just want you to know I'm working on this. <gasps> you said it. Right on. There's power in it. Have a good weekend.